Thanks very much, everyone, for being here. As I said, it's a great pleasure and honor to be able to present my thoughts. So I'm going to be talking about the mathematical basis of models and consciousness. And just to fix some terminology in advance, so I'm going to be speaking about experience and not consciousness, which are defined for this talk as the totality of impressions, feelings, thoughts, perceptions, etc., which someone lives through at a particular instance of time. For example, right now you have an experience. And furthermore, I'm going to be talking about aspects of experience, that is specific or general features, parts or element of a particular experience. So for example, color and color experience would be an aspect of experience. And um, the starting point of my following of this talk is really the following. So I take the physical domain and experience to be epistemically distinct. So those are two just things where a priori we have a different sort of way of accessing them. And I take it that the scientific study of consciousness is really about discovering how these two epistemically distinct domains are related. And in doing so, models of consciousness, um, I take for the purpose of that talk to be hypothesis about these relations which are expressed in formal mathematical terms. So they are basically formal laws or theories, um, if you like, about how nature could relate these things. So what they do is they take a mathematical description of a physical system and then they relate that to as a law, a bridging law, or maybe as a unified theory to a mathematical description of experience. And now I think most of us, or maybe all of us, would agree that the mathematical description of experience is well defined, yeah? or at least well understood. So we, we know how to model various levels of the brain, or maybe even we know a good deal about the fundamentally physical theory. And I would claim that the same is not true about the mathematical description of experience. I would say there's at least to date no systematic analysis of which mathematical space or structure um, one is supposed to use for this epistemically separated domain when building models of consciousness. And the purpose of my talk is really to discuss um, what this could be. Now obviously there are answers out there. Um, so for example, um, William just told us an answer and that was really great. So in integrated information theory, well, the space of experience is the following. So let P just be defined as the space of probability distributions of a system state. And then integrated information theory tells you, you take two copies of these and one copy of the positive real numbers. Uh, that's then called a concept space. And then you take the K-fold Cartesian product of this triple. And that is what according to the current 3.0 IT um, is the space of experience. And the elements thereof are called maximally irreducible conceptual structures. Another model, for example, conjugated networks model, which was invented um, by Chetan Prakash, who's here, and Don Hoffman models the space of experience as a measurable space. Or, for example, Jonathan's model, which we're going to hear about more during the conference, expected flow and entropy minimization, that models the space of experience as um, two sets, set of system nodes and set of st no states of these system nodes, and each is equipped with weighted relations or weighted graphs, which take two elements of the set to the unit interval. So that was quick, and the only upshot of that slide was really there's different answers. And at least if these things are trying to speak about the same aspects of experience, well, some of them will be, ha will be having the right structure and others not. And the goal of my talk is to develop a more systematic way of doing that. Now, in order to do so, I will be using two guiding principles, which are not unknown to most of you. And the first is really, I think, is probably known to almost everyone. That's the guiding principle of the explanatory gap. So just to get everyone on the same page, well, there's an explanatory gap between some phenomenon and the contemporary uh, method of explanation used in science, if and only if this phenomenon does not satisfy a necessary requirement for the application of this notion of explanation. So in other words, if I'm studying a phenomenon, which for, for whatever reason, I do not know how to, how to sort of apply the notions of explanations we have in science, then there's an explanatory gap. And of course, that implies that we need to somehow find a new way of approaching this phenomenon. Um, and now the guiding principle, um, which you could entitle simply as explanatory gaps matter, is the following. Um, I'm going to say, like, that's, that's nothing sort of necessary. It's just a principle. I think it's reasonable. Non-reductive theories, if and only if there's an explanatory gap. So that means if I'm applied now to aspects of experience, if there's an aspect of experience that exhibits an explanatory gap, then it, according to this principle, it would be a good idea to look for non-reductive theories, like IIT. IIT is a non-reductive theory. Um, on the other hand, if there's an aspect of experience which does not exhibit an explanatory gap, then I really think we can explain that in terms of reductive theory. So tie it down to the brain dynamics or tie it down to a more physical description. Okay, 
And of course, most of you know, so the notion of explanatory gap was brought up or invented by Levine, but the most systematic account of it was really given by David Chalmers. And um, so to, to make things short, I think Chalmers' definition doesn't work. It has several problems, and I'll just outline one here. For example, um, the, the notion of explanation on which he builds his conceptual thinking is the following. He would say scientific explanation is the explanation of structure and function. Where structure is now just a spatial temporal structure and function is, quote, a causal role in the production of behavior. So think about the heart. The heart is um, sort of what it would, according to this notion of explanation, an explanation of the heart be. It would explain the shape of the heart and the variation of this spatial shape in time. That would be the structure and the function would be the pumping of blood. Now, that is certainly a correct notion of explanation for various bits of science, but not for all of science. For example, I would claim that this does not capture the notion of explanation we use in parts of physics, in particular in fundamental physics. And maybe to back that, if you look at what philosophers say about scientific explanation, none of these is compatible with that. So that's just one problem of many. The upshot is that explanatory gap does not work, in my opinion, but I'm happy to discuss this. Um, so that brings me to the second guiding principle. So um, basically on the lookout of, for an actual or true explanatory gap. And of course, all of you know this, what is it like to be? By Thomas Nagel, 1974. And just to be clear, these are words. And the only thing they do is really they are ref referring to aspects of experience. So if I tell you what was it like for you to drink a beer yesterday, that refers to something. Um, and that's sort of the power behind those things. And now Nagel subjects these things to a very systematic analysis. And I think this is one of the best papers ever written. I think, of course, there's disagreement about that. Now, here's Nagel's Nagel's main point, which I will not argue for, but that's the point he makes. So he, he says, we do not even have a conception of the identity between a what is it like aspect of experience and a physical state. So he says, we do not know how to formulate that. And of course, I mean, he argues for that. That's a very sort of subtle argument. And so maybe to, to put it, to put it uh, to say a metaphor which he's using, so he's basically saying, the situation in which we are with respect to the identity between what is like aspect of experience and physical states is similar to the situation a pre-Socratic philosopher would be in if you would ask him to uh, make sense of the identity between mass and energy. Yeah? And so that's really the point he makes. And I kind of, um, so uh, of course, I mean, so I, like it convinced me. Um, however, the point is like, this is not very suitable for axiomatization. So um, in order to axiomatize thing, things, I'll be working with a slight generalization thereof. So I want to focus on aspects of experience of which we do not have a conception <coughs> of the identity over several experience, su experiencing subjects. Yeah? So let me give you um, a small, simple example. Simple examples are always, or can always be very tricky, but it's very good at least to convey my point. If you look at the clear sky and have a color experience, and I look at the clear sky and, ha and have a color experience, we could ask the question, how, how do we know that this color experience is the same? And my point would be, but that's up for discussion, of course, that we have no means to establish that. Now, of course, most of you would think, well, if we just look at the brain state, we measure the brain state, and if we have a model of consciousness, then we maybe could establish um, that these things are, um, that we are having the same color experience, and I'll come to that point just right now. First, let me just tell you, I'll be using two words for these things. So I will call them non-collatable aspects of experience. The German word is actually a bit more, um, so fits better, that would be nicht abgleichbar. Um, I try to translate it, non-collatable aspects of experience. And I'm also be denoting them by qualia. So qualia, of course, is a variable which everyone uses in his or her analysis to denote whatever is specific, special about experience. Okay, but to come back, um, so the non-collatability implies, so if we do not have a means to establish the identity of an aspect of experience, that implies that we don't have a mean of referring to that. So if I build a model of consciousness, or I'm in an experiment, and I write down, um, for example, a color blue. Yeah? Now, if it is true that I have no means to establish the identity of my blue experience with someone else's experience, this reference is empty. It can either only refer to mine, yeah, or it, is, like, it has an em empirical ambiguity. And that's the reason why this thought about models doesn't help us. Basically, what I'm saying here is that um, the collatability comes first, the model second. Models of consciousness need collatability, at least in the, in the ordinary formulation. Okay, 
And maybe just, just if you again look at what philosophers say about scientific explanation, you realize that there's several models which, which are being preferred and discussed. You realize that each and every one of these assumes that the explanandum, so that which is to, to be explained, is collatable. Yeah? So there's really, according to that at least, there is a fundamental explanatory gap, and that's nice because now, because now we can apply the first guiding principle. Okay, so what's the resulting picture? So let's try this kind of Venn diagram. So let's just assume this denotes all of the aspects of experience. It's just a schematic. Well, then the picture which results is first of all this. So I would claim there are non-collatable aspects of experience. And I'm just using the word qualia for them. And then, of course, there's also collatable aspects of experience. So for example, the typical things being done in masking experience, I would say they talk about collatable aspects and maybe even more. And um, the collatable aspects, according to the first guiding principle, they are to be studied by reductive theories, right? So they are to, for example, predictive processing. I would even call global neural workspace theory a reductive theory. And um, I would even claim, but I'm not going to go into this, that the mathematical representation of these collatable aspects is straightforward. I mean, that has to do with what I think about the relation of language and mathematics. So we don't have to discuss this here. But I think that is where we can apply science as usual, right? And maybe there's, the collatable aspects are really a huge part, or at least a huge part of the structure of experience. But now what about the non-collatable aspects? So as I said, there is a fundamental explanatory gap. And furthermore, this is of course reminiscent of Wittgenstein's private language argument and the ineffability raised by many. So I mean, there's a problem here. And in fact, Nagel would, um, or in his article, asks for a new theoretical form, which he thought to be in the distant lecture future. So I hope it's long enough now. Just kidding. Um, but in any case, um, so I'll be trying to convince you that these things can be addressed scientifically in a meaningful way by us answering two questions. The first is how, how do we represent them mathematically? The second is how then, based on this representation, we can address them scientifically. Now the following slide is the representation, the mathematical representation, and this is like surprisingly simple, at least on a conceptual level. I'll be using two phenomenological facts. The first one is that um, qualia defined as non-collatable aspects can be recognized. So you can just notice when you go to bar tonight that what is it like to have that beer for you was the same it was like to have another beer for you at another time. And that really allows us to introduce labels. Yeah? So for example, colors. You could think of colors as label or you just number the tastes you've had. Um, that's, of course, a, a little bit of an idealization, but after all, I'm a mathematician, so I hope that's okay. So then the second phenomenologic fact which I'm using is, some, is one which actually William just introduced for me. So that are the relations. I would claim that there are relations between non-collatable aspects of experience, and these relations are collatable. Yeah? So let me just to, like, explain that to you by reference to authority. So for example, Chalmer would say, even if experiences are in some sense ineffable, relations between experiences are not. We have no trouble discussing these relations, whether they be relations of similarity and difference, geometric relations, relations of intensity, and so on. Or in Thomas Nagel's words, structural features of perception might be more accessible to ex objective descriptions. And so since these relations are collatable, what you can do is you can represent them on the set of labels, and that in, in fact turns the set of labels into a mathematical space. And I, in a paper, the reference to which I'll give later, I've done several examples. And let me just mention two because they're related to the works of two people who are here, Robert and Pedro. Um, so for example, if you would consider that there's a similarity relation between qualia, which is, only, which is binary. Things are similar or they are not similar. Then you, can re then you can, it's a little bit of math, but it's really straightforward. Then you can represent that as a topological or pre-topological structure on the space of labels. Yeah? And that is like, there's, I, I'm absolutely convinced there's nothing to be criticized. This is meticulous. Or for example, I mean this example, which is due to Robert. Um, the second thing is if you think about qualia being composed. So if you were of the opinion that whenever you have two qualia, you could compose them, and that is another one, another non-collatable aspect of experience, well, then you can represent that as a partial order on the set of labels. And I'm happy to go through these examples in detail if you ask me later, I'm doing coffee or whatever. Okay. So the status here is let's assume we have this space of labels whose structure represents, um, whose mathematical structure represents the structural features of perception. So now I would want to convince you that we can now use that to address these things scientifically. And how will it work? It works as follows. I will give you a definition of model of consciousness, which is straightforward up to the last point, which is not straightforward or not, well, may, at least people might disagree. And then on the next slide, I will explain to you why this allows to address these aspects in an empirically well-defined, meaningful, and predictive way. And that's all, up from this point onwards, it's all math. 
and solve it now. So, what's the given? Let's assume we're given a physical theory of choice. For example, a neural network or some other description of the brain. Yeah? Let's denote by big P the state space of this physical theory and let's just use this curly I here for the time. Okay, now comes the definition of models of consciousness. Most of you would probably reluctantly agree to the first few points. So a model of consciousness is a formal theory T um, whose dynamical variables are just here, we'll take one label and we'll take one physical state. So little l is the label, p is the physical state. So then if these are the dynamical variables, the kinematically possible trajectories, so those like are, these are like all conceivable and mathematically well-defined trajectories, um, they are just a subset of all the trajectories going through this product space here, yeah? So you take a label and p and you have this time variable. Now, the model of consciousness has some formal laws, which we don't want to talk about because we don't want to restrict the mathematical structure. But what they need to do, they need to pick out of the possible trajectories some which are the solutions, or in physics called the dynamically possible trajectories. Yeah? So the solution set is just a subset of all trajectories. And I think up to this point, everyone basically needs, agree, needs to agree. If you think about it in more detailed terms, that's the generalization thereof. That's what theories are in physics and biology and everywhere. That's just a scientific theory. But now comes the bit which takes care of the non-collatability, and that's the following. So this model needs to, in order to be empirically well-defined, it needs to carry a symmetry. And the symmetry group here, out L, that is the automorphism group of the space of labels. This elements of this group describe the freedom of choosing labels of every experiencing subject. Um, and the model needs to carry this out symmetry group. And now please don't uh, just switch off because there's a little bit of a longer thing. So what I mean by that, and that's really the notion of symmetry we use in modern physics, um, and that comes out on its own, it's not imposed. So what I mean by that, we need a group action, it picks one element of the automorphism group and a trajectory and gives you a new trajectory. And I wrote down here how it's defined, I'll re refer to that in a minute. And the requirement is for this to be a symmetry is really that this action leaves the set of solutions invariant. Yeah? And you see this, this requirement really makes sure that the theory is even well-defined with respect to relabeling. And now the essential bit in this definition is this little phi chi here. So let me briefly talk about this action. So the action takes a group element and a trajectory. And now how does it act? Well, that's a label, so the group element can act on that by definition because it's the automorphism group. Well, what over here? So this phi chi denotes an out L action on the physical trajectories. Yeah? So this phi C is an action of the automorphism group on the physical trajectories. And this action can be trivial, but it doesn't have to, and that is the crucial difference, a tiny mathematical difference, um, which, allows, which allows this thing to address these non-collatable aspects. Just a small remark, this is unrelated to the closure of the physical. For example, in IT, this is non-trivial. Yeah, this phi g is non-trivial. Um, okay, so that's the definition. Of course, the time is very short of this talk, so it's more like a, um, a, a trailer, if you like. So let me just tell you what, what this definition allows you to do. Well, first of all, it allows you to address these non-collatable aspects in an empirically meaningful way. As I said, this out L symmetry makes sure that the theory is well-defined under ch changes of labels. That's similar to gravity, you know. We want gravity, we want to be able to work in any coordinate system, therefore we have to be morphism invariants, which allows you to change coordinates at will. The second thing is that it's empirically meaningful, and I mean, that, like, there's a little uh, more math behind that than I can do in this talk, but maybe the upshot is the following. This phi g really, really realizes the interaction, right? This group, this automorphism action on the physical trajectory, realizes an interaction between these non-collatable aspects um, and the physical domain, and that's prior to you being sort of, um, prior to you applying the theory and sort of modding out the group to make sure that the thing is, so to make sure you have empirically well-defined things. That was a bit cryptic, maybe talk to me if you're interested or, it's all in this paper over here, yeah. And um, finally, um, that thing is predictive and that took me very long to show because I didn't want to make a specific assumption to build a specific model. So what I did or what I tried to do was um, I, basically used an argumentation which is very similar to this gauge principle in physics. Yeah? The problem is the gauge principle in physics is not like on the level of a theorem. I wanted to do all of this stuff on the level of mathematical physics, so I really spelled these things out in detail, and it's all in the paper, it's like 20 pages long, but there's a theorem where you can see that under very generic circumstances, this group has sort of pretty strong empirical consequences. Yeah? 
And so that was not to, to really sort of go ahead and make predictions, but that was really to make the point that this framework can be predictive. So if you build models of consciousness in these ways, and by the way, that's compatible with IIT and with um, causal conscious agent networks, um, this framework is like, it's really just a framework and it allows you to formulate these models. Of course, in each and every one of these models, it has some things which were probably should be done a bit differently. Okay, and that's all I wanted to say. Wrap up in two seconds. So first, so the upshot is this definition of model of consciousness is really less a definition of sort of having laws that bridge to these two domains, but more of a definition of having a unified theory, just as we have in other domains of physics between sort of the physical domain and experience. And the last thing I wanted to say is that this is a generalization of Chalmers' strategy of proposing psychophysical laws in three ways. Yeah? First, it's not laws, it's a theory. Theories are always more general. Second, it avoids some assumption which he has to make, for example, related to the closure of the physical. This is compatible with closure or non-closure, whatever you like. Um, and third, a generalization in the sense that I really think that it is built on, a, on an honest explanatory gap, or honest is the wrong word, sorry, on a true explanatory gap, um, and it's not built on an artifact of using, like, maybe um, using a too small notion of explanation. Okay, that's all. Thanks very much for your attention.